Welcome to Thursday, January 19th. We're going to talk about relaxing and how to make yourself thin using relaxation. Right? Can you believe it? Because um, it's possible, right? And the secret is that there's a lot of benefits you get out of relaxation beyond even just the weight loss, but it's one of the most powerful tools you have to actually lose weight and keep it off, to really master your weight. And I want to talk about some of the reasons for that. Cause again, there's a lot of them, you know, there really are. And I think sometimes people minimize how important relaxation is to your health and happiness, but also how important it is to your weight management, right? And your weight mastery. It's one of the key factors that's driving your weight regardless. Right. Your, your tension levels, your relaxation levels, they're both driving and influencing your weight at a very deep level. So the first thing I want to recognize is that, you know, we want to look at weight loss in a more holistic sense, right? So you can't just look at weight loss, I think, as this, we tend to see it just as like a bank account, debits, credits, right? Because we're, we're missing a lot of the context of what actually is impacting your weight. I think it's much more effective instead of like the bank account credit debit thing is to look at your weight more as like the stock market. There's lots of pieces that are influencing everything else. And one of the key ones is your relaxation because what, because what's your relaxation? First of all, let's start there. Um, we're really talking about your nervous system right off the bat. That's one of the key ones. And so when you are stressed, your sympathetic fight or flight freeze response nervous system is activated. OK, as opposed to when you're relaxed and that's your parasympathetic nervous system, your rest and digest one. Right. So what's happening when your parasympathetic nervous system is activated? Well, think about it. Right. When you go into fight or flight mode, all the energy, all the blood goes out to your muscles to fight or to run <laughs> or you just freeze. Right. But a way to think of it, and I think this is really helpful, is that the energy comes from your brain and it goes down into your body. Right. Because when you're in fight, flight or freeze mode, you're not you're not thinking, right? You're not logicking things out and thinking about what you should do. And, and, and well, should I do that? Should I do this? You're just responding. You're reacting, right? And so this is really important to understand because a lot of times in our modern environment, even though we're not being chased by animals or in these life or death situations, our sympathetic nervous system is activated, right? So again, it's, it's a weird, weird quirk of the modern life that we're safer than we've ever been. And yet, so many of us are walking around with overactivated sympathetic nervous systems in a consistent chronic state of fight or flight. Okay. Now, what does that mean? <laughs> we need to understand a little more depth to that to really understand again, how it's affecting your weight, but more importantly, your entire life. Right? So the key thing I like to focus on, and we'll talk about the body in a second, because there's physical changes too, biochemical changes of when you're stressed that prevent you from losing weight. Right. But one of the key ones I like to focus on is what's going on with your brain. Right. And so when you're in fight or flight mode, what happens is you pull the energy in your brain away from your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex is the newest part of your brain. It's over. It lays over the rest of your brain. The rest of your brain is kind of limbic system. And then the primitive part of your brain down at the bottom that runs all your basic you know, functions. So when you go to a fight or flight response, you pull the energy away from the prefrontal cortex. You're not using your executive functioning. <laughs> you're not using your logic, your creativity your wisdom when you're in fight or flight mode. You see, you're just being very reactionary. You're just, you're just responding to whatever's going on. Okay. So right off the bat, you're limiting, you're not being your full self. You're not tapping into your full creativity, wisdom, um, intuitive thinking. You're just responding, you know, um, you become more animal-like in that sense. You know, so if we're walking around with overactivated sympathetic nervous systems, what I want you to think about is that you're walking around not connected to your full resources, your ability to think clearly. Right. And so what's happening is you're in a state of, again, physically, we know about the physical part of it, but mentally is the more important part, in my opinion. And so you're walking around being very reactive. You know, you're just responding to things. You're not calm and, and you know, thinking about them in a, in a logical, rational way. You're just responding. And so a lot of people, if you're walking around with the sympathetic nervous system activated, you're not thinking as well as you can. You're not connected to your, your sense of humor, your wit, your intellect, your logic, your rationality, right? your solution-oriented mind. You're just responding. So that's one of the first reasons why relaxation is so important to your weight loss is because it changes the way you're using your brain, the way you're connecting to your brain. And so when you relax... And so I want you to start thinking and using these terms. When you relax, you're activating your parasympathetic nervous system. And one of the things that happens is your vagus nerve, which really modulates a lot of what's going on in your body, 
depending on whether you're sympathetic fight or flight or whether you're this relaxed parasympathetic nervous system activated is once you get into that relaxed state, you start to be able to think more clearly, right? You become more of who you are, more connected to the full person who is you, right? <laughs> As opposed to when you're just very reactionary, stressed, and just very tense and reactive, you see? So right off the bat, that's a different quality of life, right? Is your life not a lot better when you're thinking in a calm, clear way, when you're more resourceful, when you're more focused on solutions, when you can see the bigger picture, right? Because there's even another aspect, right? When your fight or flight, nervous system is activated, even your vision focuses in, it, it zooms in, right? Because you have to focus on the, the threat at hand, you see? So as soon as you relax, your perspective starts to widen. You can see more things, you can make more connections, you know? So all this stuff's really important because um, if we're always overactive with the sympathetic nervous system, just the way we're thinking is causing us to not see all the options we have in front of us. It causes us to just react and just do what we think of doing. And so that's the mental part. The physical part, right, is when your sympathetic nervous system activates, you release more cortisol in your body. Right? We've heard of this, the stress hormone. And so when you release the cortisol into your body, it triggers more hunger and, oh, hello, it triggers more hunger and it uh, causes your body to hold on to the weight. Right? It goes into this, this, there's a threat. Let's just hold on to everything. We don't know what's happening. You know, so you could be in a, in a famine, right? All of a sudden there's food scarce. And you start releasing more cortisol in your body. Hold on. Whoa. Let's just try and slow things down as much as possible. So there's a physiological effect as well. And that's important. And so when I, we have overactivated sympathetic nervous systems, when we're tense, when we're stressed, we tend to crave unhealthy foods. Our ability to stop ourselves from eating those unhealthy foods reduces. And our ability to come up with new solutions and creative answers to the problems we're facing goes down. You see, so I always tell people like investing in your relaxation, making your relaxation a central piece of your weight mastery is, I think it's, it's definitely crucial. Is it absolutely necessary? It's, it's as close to necessary as I think you're going to get, you know, because if you're just a stressed case, you're always stressed out in that state. It's very difficult to change your behaviors. It's very difficult to make healthy food choices consistently day after day, meal after meal, you know, and you know this, you know, um, but people tend to minimize how important relaxation is. You know, we live in a, people are stressed, right? That's the, that's kind of, that's the norm is that people are walking around stressed. And again, we're not being chased by lions, but we can feel stressed from any number of things that technically don't have to be stressful, right? So, so even money, for example, right? We can stress about money in a lot of ways. Now I know people say, well, I'm stressed about not having enough money. I get that. But a lot of times the stress we're feeling about money is not related to the actual situation. You know, it's not a life or death situation is what I'm trying to say a lot of times. Um, we can get stressed driving a car, right? We can get stressed like, like any waiting in line, the lines long, sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight response activated. Right. So there's, we can watch a show, you know, what I mean? it's, it's like unlimited. It's a, there's so many modern things that can trigger our sympathetic nervous system, you know? Um, so it's, it's so important, I think, to make the cornerstone, the foundational piece, physical piece of your weight mastery is really developing the ability to relax and to feel more relaxed on purpose. Okay. Because every time you practice relaxation, you train your body, you, you, Train your body and your mind to recognize what it feels like to be relaxed, what it feels like to have your parasympathetic nervous system activated. And the second you do it, do it right now. I mean, you can you can literally feel it. Every time I remind myself and I actually do it, right? Because you could think about relaxing, but you have to do it. And the second you, you know, just relax the muscles, take a deep breath, it feels different, you know, and you literally start to think different. You know, you release different chemicals into your body. It feels nicer. You think more clearly. Um, you tend to make better food choices this way, you see? So this is a prevention strategy. So a lot of what I work with people on is prevention strategies, where a lot of people are dealing with the symptoms. So weight loss, for example, so much of it is you're not paying attention to your stress levels, right? If anything, a diet makes you more stressed right? It's just more you got to think about, more you got to do, and it's hard, and you got to think about stuff and make things, you're not sure you're going to do it. It's very stressful, you see? And so 
people rarely think about the relaxation because you just assume, okay, losing weight is going to be stressful. I'm just going to fight against that stress and force myself to do the right thing. You see, but that's, that's the opposite of a prevention strategy. That's a de deal with a symptom strategy. But again, what do they say? A, a pound of pre an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Right? Same thing here. You want to structure your weight mastery strategically, your weight loss strategically. And you have not been doing that. Um, you've been structuring it tactically. You get a diet that says, oh, eat this way, do this, and then force yourself to do it. Well, that's not a strategy. That's not a good long-term strategy at all. You know, And so strategic thinking is recognizing how can I set up my lifestyle so that I deal with the fundamental aspects that influence my weight and I, and I, I fix them. And so relaxation is one of those examples. So as you dedicate yourself to more relaxation in your life, you are simultaneously helping yourself master your weight and lose weight. Um, but you're getting more benefit out of it. Right? Someone says, I, I saw another TikTok about changing your neurology traumas in our physical body too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that's totally true. So yeah, if, you, if you've experienced trauma in your life, you can almost be guaranteed, unless you've done some work, there's a very good chance that you've kind of an overactive nervous system, right? It's very easy for you to go into fight or flight, okay? And so I can tell you, me personally, uh, someone says... Someone said, can I be mod? I'm not sure what that means. Um, so, so for me personally, like I was born with a tweaked up nervous system. So from the moment I was born, I know I was kind of a, a tweaked up nervous system, I say. What's that mean? I'm kind of tense. Um, kind of got a lot of energy, a lot of nervous energy. You know, um, I, I feel that way. And then I had trauma. My father died when I was nine years old. Okay, so that was, that was a trauma. That was stacked right on top of the nervous system. And so for me, it's it's been a 30 year. It wasn't until I was 19. So- from nine to 19, I was like, well, I'm, I don't want to go on the path my dad went. I'm not, I'm never going to let that happen to me. No, I was 19. I was 50, 50 pounds heavier and I was binge drinking all the time. So it's like best of intentions, but I had no strategies, you know, so I just went down the exact path that I knew. And so it, it was just pure luck in my life that at 19, I came across, I always tell this story. It's just crazy to me. Like there was one month where I literally, I came across yoga, um, martial arts, meditation, guitar, hypnosis, neurolinguistic programming, Tony Robbins. It's so all of these things just happened like within a month or two, you know, it's it just a miracle, pure miracle. But I, I used them too. And so it's been 30 years of my life really dedicated. I would say the core of it, the core of it has been my relaxation, you know? And so, yeah, someone says I had childhood abuse, lived in a constant state of fear and anxiety, always frantic. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's varying levels to it. Okay. And, um, what happens though, where the similarities are is that, so I say, I got to tweak it up nervous system, you know, and, um, you have to, you got to manage it. And, and this is the kind of the bummer part I would say, you know, is that I think you have to, I'll, so I'll tell you my story, right. And, and I'll tell you what I've learned from that is that I remember the first time it dawned on me is I remember I did yoga for the first time, right now. I always thought I, I played a lot of sports and I was, I was fairly athletic. And so I remember doing yoga and I remember being like, like I tried to do the yoga and I was completely inflexible. Like I, I couldn't get anywhere near my toes. I couldn't hardly get to my knees. I was so tight, you know? And I found that I, um, and I'm going to get to these questions in a second. Uh, I, I found that I was so tight and I was like, oh my goodness. And I, I realized it, which I think is just, a, it's an interesting when you start putting yourself into different scenarios, you recognize new things about yourself. And so putting, doing the yoga, all of a sudden I realized a lot of things in myself that were there the whole time, but I just couldn't see them in my normal way of being. And so all of a sudden I did yoga and I said, oh my God, I can't believe how tight I am, how tense and stressed I am, you know? And so it started with the awareness. And so then I became very motivated. It was a, a period of my life where I really committed to doing a lot of yoga. Um, and when I say a lot of yoga, I was doing like an hour every night. I, I was very, very committed to it, you know? And I worked up to it, but I started, there was a good five-year period where I was doing like a lot. <clears throat> I ended up getting certified as a yoga instructor as well meditations, breathing exercise, all of it. And the goal in my mind, is I said, I don't want to be tense. I want to be a relaxed person. That was the goal. And I really committed to it for a long time. Okay. And then I remember one day I was driving in the car and I was, I did this thing habitually and I still do it. I do these body scans. So where am I at? Where's my, where's my relaxation tension level at? I checked it and I realized I was tense and I got so pissed off. And I said, what the hell? I'm like, what's it going to take for me to finally become relaxed? And I remember that moment was a very, very, important moment to me in my life because I remember at that moment I said I could either say forget it I'm done with this relaxation crap it's not working or I could say I could just keep going with it 
And at that moment, I chose to keep going with it. Okay. And what I have learned since then, and in, in over the last 30 years in terms of trying to be more relaxed, is that the first thing is that I think it's very important not to measure yourself against perfection when it comes to relaxation, because relaxation is a relative thing. Okay. So I think in my mind, I imagine myself being like this Buddhist monk who never got tense again, never got stressed again. And I think that's a ridiculous idea because our nervous systems seek out variety. They're, they're always kind of bing bong in between relaxation and, and tension. Okay. There's always this movement in there. It never just stays here consistently. Okay. And so even if you're way more relaxed, there's still going to be stress and relaxation relatively. Okay. And so that was very important for me because now I no longer even, um, I don't even know if I could ever become just like this relaxed person. I, I just don't even know if it's possible anymore. So I kind of had to give up on that ideal in a sense. And I downgraded my goal, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. I know that sounds like a bad thing, right? That I gave up on it, but it made it more realistic in my opinion. And so now my goal is to be more relaxed than I would have been, you see? So I don't consider myself like a relaxed person now necessarily, but I consider myself way more relaxed than I would have been. <laughs> do you say, I hope that makes sense. And sometimes that's the best you can do, you know? And, and so, you know, ignore this if that feels demotivating to you, but that's, that's truly my experience. I've given this a lot of thought and a lot of effort. And so now I live in this place where I don't expect to be always relaxed, but I do have an amazing ability that I am very aware. So when I start to get tense and stressed, I'm very aware of it and I can catch it before, you know, on a, a zero to 10 stress scale, I catch it on a three, four now, whereas before I get like a nine, 10, you know, cause I just wasn't paying attention. So I catch it at a, a lower level and my ability to bring it back down once I'm aware of it is, is very good. Okay. And that's, seems to be where I'm going to have to accept. <laughs> I don't know if I can actually just, just change my nervous system to a completely different one that never gets stressed again, you know? So anyways, th that, that's what I've learned from that. So I think the goal that you have in your mind in terms of relaxation is very important. And I think you should recognize that if you are a person who's had abuse or traumas in the past, if you're a person who feels like you got a tweaked up nervous system, don't, don't let the goal be, I want to be perfect, you know? Because there's a saying, right? Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I find with relaxation, that can be very easy because if you feel tense, you feel like none of it's working. And I think you have to look at kind of the average, the overall. And as you make yourself, you start relaxing more throughout the day, as you increase your ability to recognize when you're tense, as you get better at being able to relax yourself when you choose to, that's a much better quality of life, tremendously better, right? And so I think it's important how you kind of look at it. Um, Someone says, I'm always in a fight or flight. I find it impossible to relax. Can't watch TV or read or do anything enjoyable. Yeah. So I think a lot of people find themselves in this place. You know, we live in a, in a environment, at least in America, a lot of it, it's, it's triggering, you know, in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, every, everything's trying to get your attention and it's very unnatural. And again, this is where we get in this weird spot where technically we're, we're relatively safe. Um, and yet, you know, we feel this overwhelming amount of stress right? That, that's, the, that's the modern life. That's, that's the world. And so what do you do to deal with that? You know, I think it's a skill set. You know, I think if you start looking at your relaxation as a skill set, and if you're always in fight or flight, there's a good chance you haven't developed this skill. And if you commit to relaxation, it's a skill like any others, you know, um, it's breaking it down into pieces and mastering those pieces and then putting them all together. Okay. So the physiology of relaxation, you know, is, Recognizing your body, where do you store the tension? Most people, it's their shoulders, their chest, their stomach, and their face, specifically the jaw, but all the muscles of the face. It's fascinating. Facial muscles are really interesting. There's a lot of them, and they really influence how you feel a lot in the moment. So learning how to be more relaxed is really a skill. And I say that to you so that you can, even if you haven't been able to do it, it's because you have not learned how to do it. And I think sometimes we think, well, I can either relax or not Well, relax. Well, no, you may not be a relaxed person, but I promise you can learn how to do it. You just got to break it down. Right. And, um, and you practice it. And it's the same way I did. Cause I wasn't relaxed in the beginning. I had to learn how to do it, you know, and it, it, it's a bit of an effort I would say, but it's one of the most worthwhile efforts I think you can make because it's a fundamental skill set to every area of your life. You know, as I was saying in the beginning, never mind the tension and how it feels. What I also think is important is recognizing the tension and how it makes you think. You know, the stress causes you to not think as clearly. 
you know? So if you're dealing with some stressful situation in your life, you got to recognize that you're dealing with that stressful situation with a limited brain. You're not thinking as clearly as you can, you know? So when you start to relax and look at things, this is personally, this is one of the reasons why I think hypnosis is so effective. It's one of the few times, like when I work with people, um, and, and I had a hypnosis office. So I work with people, all different things, you know? And so one of the things I recognize is that when people came to me about some struggle in their lives, and it's just like this with weight as well. It's like, every time you think about your weight, you may not realize it, but you're activating your sympathetic nervous system. You're, you're creating, eliciting a state of stress. You just link those two things together because you've had so many stressful, negative experiences in terms of your weight that when you think about your weight, it triggers that nervous system. And the same thing happens with traumas or other things we've had. We keep thinking about them. They trigger those that, that state in us. So the interesting thing about hypnosis and meditation to a certain degree, but especially hypnosis, because it's a it's hypnosis, you're actively going after the thing that's bothering you. And what are we doing? The very first thing we're doing with hypnosis, and I swear this is probably 90% of why it's so effective, is that let's just say you're, you want to work on weight loss. You want to work on some phobia you have. Okay. What's the first thing you're doing with hypnosis? You're relaxing. You know, you're closing your eyes. You're starting to breathe deeper. You're relaxing the muscles. You know, and so the first time in a lot of people's lives, they're thinking about the thing that is their challenge and that usually stresses them out. But now they're thinking about it with a relaxed body and a relaxed, activated mind. And so they're able to see this thing that they've been struggling with their whole lives from a different perspective, in essence, you know, with a more creative mind, right? With more connection to their intelligence and their wisdom and their humor and their perspective. And so a lot of times, the hypnosis just allows, it frees you up from all the emotion of it that you normally feel when you think about it. It frees that up and it allows you to think more clearly, see it from a different angle and ultimately come up with better solutions, you know, and strategies. So it's the same thing with weight. You know, you, you have to recognize when you think about weight loss, you trigger this sympathetic nervous system and it's stressful. But the, the bigger problem is that it causes you to loop and just think the same things. You're just reactively thinking about weight loss the same way you always do. You never think about it a different way. This is part of the hypnosis, okay? That again, when you think about weight loss, you're trapped. You're trapped in a way of thinking about it. You can't think outside of this box. You know, it's a diet box. You were hypnotized by the diets to think about weight loss in a diet-oriented fashion. And because when you think about weight, you reference painful situations, stepping on the scale, seeing your picture and you look big, um, the clothes don't fit. You saw your reflection, oh shit, look how big I am. Pain, 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 sympathetic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system, <laughs> limited thinking, and cause you just think in loops, um, very limited loops, you know? Because when you think about your weight loss, I, I was like, you think you know what you need to do. You think you're thinking about it logically, but you're not, you know? The truth is you have no system, no understanding how to lose weight long-term. You know how to lose weight. You know you could stop eating and then you'd start losing weight, but you have absolutely zero idea of how to actually live as a thin person for the rest of your life on your autopilot. You have no, you haven't got the foggiest clue. You know, you're basically sitting here just hoping, just wishing somehow something will change next Sunday so that Monday you start and you, you know, some, all of a sudden get the results, you know, but you have no actual plan, you know? And a lot of that is because you are stuck physically in a sympathetic nervous system when you think about weight loss and you're trapped in this diet hypnosis that they put you in, you know? And so you can't think about it any other way and it keeps you trapped and stuck, all right? So relaxation is actually a powerful way to kind of get, get through that. But you who's struggling with the fight or flight, again, you, you, have, to, you have to work on it. Like, again, metaphorically, I'd say what it's like is like, you know, um, writing with the other hand. I, I think that's a good example. You know how to write, but you can only write with one hand. But if you wanted to learn how to write with the other hand, you just have to sit down and practice it a little bit at a time you know, and the process sucks. That's what I was going to say about relaxation. You got to recognize the relaxation is like, you have to, cause I used to think like I was going to hit this point where I wouldn't be stressed anymore. You know, it seems so silly now. You know what I mean? Well, what do I gonna say? I was a young guy. I didn't think about it right, but I just thought like, well, I just, I'd relax my body and then I just wouldn't be stressed anymore. That's what people think with their weight loss though too, right? You just think well, I'll just lose the weight. And then what magically what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay. The day comes, you hit your goal weight. Well now what, how are you going to keep yourself motivated? Cause now you don't have the excitement of the scale going down either, you know? So, so I think sometimes our brain just like, it just, it wants to believe the easiest thing and it wants to believe, okay, well I'll do yoga for a while and I'll learn to relax and I won't be stressed anymore. <laughs> and so what I've come to realize is that stress and relaxation, both, both sides of it, it's like a chronic issue. And it's something you have to recognize in your mind. There is no end point to it. 
the end point is when you're not alive anymore. That's it, you know? And so you have to think about the relaxation, almost like brushing your teeth. You know, you can't brush the hell out of your teeth this week and then see you next week or next month, right? You have to just a little bit every day, right? It's all about consistency, you know? Um, and that's one of the themes of my, my program, right? It's all about consistency over intensity because so often it comes to your weight loss, you're so obsessed with the intensity because you're so obsessed with fast results, you know? But really, you're, you don't want to lose weight. You want to master your weight, you, you know, because how long do you want to lose the weight for? forever right <laughs> so it's like if that's the case then then what you do to lose the weight is something you have to do forever you know and i know that 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 feels like a punch in the gut for a lot of people because you're living this fantasy that you're just going to lose the weight and then something magical happens <laughs> you know and i, I don't mean to burst your bubble but it doesn't and so i'd rather you realize that now you know then lose the weight and then get there and like i, I can't maintain it then put the weight back on that's the worst you know such so disappointment so the relaxation to, to the person who feels like you can't relax, you can't do anything enjoyable, is just to start small and develop it. Think of it like a skill, you know, that would be my most important advice to you and, and to everyone, you know, that's how I think of it. And um, I think of it like brushing my teeth. I need to do a little bit every day consistently. And so I do it meditating. I do it, um, you know, with literally throughout the day, I'm managing it, but I have some moments where I'm specifically relaxing and practicing that because when I relax, especially like meditation is probably my longest relaxation period where I'm relaxing my body, quieting my mind, and I'm breathing more fully. All right. And so I'm training my body and my mind to be familiar with relaxation. How do I do it? You know, because a lot of people just think of it as a, um, so it's so, okay. So this is called anomalization in NLP, uh, well, in, in linguistics. And so when we take a verb, an action word, and we turn into a noun. And so people do this with relaxation a lot where they just think of it as a thing. I can't relax. You see, it's so I can't relax. I, I, I don't know how to relax, you know, and they separate themselves from the verb, the action of relaxing. And of course, you can relax yourself a bit. You can relax your shoulders. But this is the thing you have to break it down because you're making it seem like one big chunk. I can't relax. Well, what can't you relax? Can you relax your shoulders if you think about it? Well, of course, you just drop them. Now, you may not be good at that. Maybe hard for you to do. But, you know, come on, you can relax them. Can you relax your chest? Yeah, of course. Can you relax your stomach? Yeah, if you think about it. Can you relax your jaw? Yeah, you know? So you break it down into these pieces and you get good at it, you know? And so that's what I did. I broke it down in all these pieces. Now what happens is when I relax, it's become a system. Think about when you write with your hand, there's a lot of things going on. Your arm's doing something, your shoulder, the way you're holding it, the way you're holding your, your fingers and, and all these things. And it depends on the letter you're writing and how you're writing, where you're at the page. And you adjust all these, but you don't think of it in all those little micro parts. You just think of it now as writing. And so with relaxation, the first thing you want to learn it is break it down into pieces. And so different people store attention in different places. For me, it was always my shoulders and then my stomach were the prime ones, followed by my chest and my face. Okay. So what I do now when I want to relax is my shoulders relax. And as soon as my shoulders relax, my stomach relaxes. And then I take a breath because I've practiced this literally millions of times at this point. So now it's become one behavior again. You know, so there's a, there's a Bruce Lee quote, right? And he says, before I learned martial arts, a punch was just a punch. He goes, and then I was learning martial arts and a punch was way more than a punch. And then I learned martial arts and a punch was just a punch again. Right. So I think that applies here that at first, you know, you haven't learned how to relax. And so you've just taken it on and you almost have like a fixed mindset where you think, well, you're either a relaxed person or you're not, you know, and that has stopped you from breaking down. Well, what is relaxation? And of course, it's a skill. You could learn it. You can relax your shoulders if you want to. You know, and if you have trouble with it, that becomes the focus. You know, you, you massage them, you take a hot shower, you focus on it, you learn how to relax them, you know, and you get better at it. And as you get better at it, you start putting it all together and then it becomes easier for you. All right. So I promise you can get better at it though. So yeah, if any, you have any questions about relaxation, feel free to ask those. Someone says, what about relaxing the mind? Yeah. Um, I want to see what this person says, I want to relax more than anything. I'll take an hour a day. Yeah, sure. I'll tell you this. So let me just tell you this about the relaxation and working on it is, and I, I know I'm not sure exactly what you mean by take an hour a day. Um, I'm sure you would like to have an hour a day of relaxation. Maybe, you know what I mean? Like again, you know, what happens too, by the way, is that the sympathetic nervous system, the, the tension, the stress is, is addictive. You know, you got to recognize that. So it's a powerful state as, as stressful as it is. Oh, thanks for the chili. I love chili peppers. Um, the, the addictive, it's addictive, you know, like it, it feels powerful, you know, to feel that, that energy you know, but it's depleting because it takes up a lot of energy. So what, what I will say about relaxation is this, that when you're working on it, sometimes it can be kind of frustrating. So 
ironically, one of the best things you could do with relaxation is sometimes to make it really simple, reduce to the ridiculous, um, spend a minute relaxing, you know, a minute in the morning, a minute's a long time. I'm not going to do it here to us because all, all the viewers will leave. But um, I do this with my my students all the time, with, with clients in my, my program, is we'll take a minute and just relax. And you, I don't think you realize how long a minute is, how powerful a minute can be to your body and mind. Right? Really, really important. Someone says, what about relaxing the mind? Yeah. I say you do both of them at the same time. You know, even the idea of just closing these eyes while you stay awake is such a powerful state. 75% of your brain is dedicated to visual stimuli. So the second you close your eyes and you stay awake, you free up all this mental energy. So this is the one minute meditation. You close your eyes, you relax your body. You relax your body, shoulders, chest, stomach, face. And then you just breathe. Ideally, you want to breathe through your nose. And you're just breathing. You do this for a minute. It's powerful. I mean, you feel so much better. You feel rejuvenated. You know, you feel better at the very least, you know? And so the mind becomes part of it because you're, so you so your state at any moment in time, you're in a state and your state is a combination of two things, your physiology and your psychology, your body and your brain. And they're always influencing each other. It's a cybernetic loop. But when you want to change your state, we always start with the body because you feel the body's the more impactful thing. You can't feel a thought. The thoughts can impact your body and then you feel what's going on in your body. But if you relax your body right now, even while your mind's spinning, you'll still feel better. You'll still have a sense of relief. But if you don't relax your mind, it'll just ramp your body back up again. So yeah, both of them is what we want to work on. That's why meditation is so powerful. That's why hypnosis is so powerful because you're, you're awake, but your eyes are closed and you're bringing your attention inwards and you're able to relax yourself much deeper. Right. Um, um. I have dystonia, a movement disorder that's terrible. Do you think hypnosis could help? I don't know what dystonia is. Um, I think hypnosis helps absolutely everything. I, I think hypnosis, self-hypnosis specifically, by the way, because all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. All right. So we start with that, that understanding um, because, you know, I can't hypnotize you if you don't want to be hypnotized. All right. So all hypnosis is technically self-hypnosis, but the most powerful hypnosis is when you learn yourself how to run your own mind. So the real simple thing is you have a conscious mind, a subconscious mind, and what hypnosis is, is you consciously impacting your subconscious mind, impacting it, influencing it, programming it, right? And so you're, you're, you're a subconscious creature. Your subconscious mind's running the show, everything, practically. And so I think that learning how to hypnotize yourself, which just means program your subconscious mind, helps with absolutely everything. So even without understanding, I, I don't know what dystonia is, but knowing that your mind's involved <laughs> with it. Um, it helps everything. So movement disorder, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of how hypnosis would help you without even knowing what dystonia is. But I bet there are things you could do behaviorally, habitually that would help it, right? There's some decisions you make in life that make it worse and some that make it better. I'm going to assume because most things are like that. And your ability to get yourself to do the right things is weak because you consciously try and just force yourself to do things, right? This is the problem with everyone. They try and create change. You don't understand your mind. You don't even know what you're doing. Your idea of change is you use your conscious willpower to force yourself to act different. And your brain's not set up that way. You know, you're a subconscious creature. You're meant to learn things and then run them on autopilot pretty much. This is why you do what you did. You're not like every week, you're not doing like brand new things, eating brand new stuff, going brand new places. You do what you did last week. <laughs> I mean, you do, you do it, you know, oh, today's Thursday. You did what you did last Thursday, probably. You know what I mean? And if your schedule's a little off, you're always repeating the same patterns. We're not constantly learning new things. You know, it's like, it's like, um, I'll give you the difference, right? It's like, you ever go on like a vacation somewhere new and it's like, you don't know, really know anything where anything is. It's cool. Like in one sense, but it's also really tiring, right? <laughs> Cause you have to think about everything. Like you want to get a coffee. I don't know where to get a coffee, right? You want to get the paper. I don't know where to get the paper. I don't know where to eat. I don't know what to do. You have no routine, right? That's what it would be like if, to live consciously. And that's what dieting feels like for people. You're trying to micromanage yourself into new behaviors. It doesn't work. Your brain's not set up that way. So a much better approach to change is to use your conscious mind to program your subconscious mind to do the things you want to do. So in that sense, I would almost guarantee that being able to influence your, your subconscious mind would help with dystonia. Um, I'm severely overweight too, Sai. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it all come, it all goes together, you know? So um, that's why I say the relaxation to me, and I'm going to get into this in a second, but the relaxation I think is a crucial part of getting your weight under control. 
I, I really do for a lot of reasons. I'm going to go to in a second. So this person says, yeah, my mind really, it won't shut up. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. A lot of people I work with, if I had to just define the, the number one characteristic of, of the people I've worked with in my career, um, it is people that are overthinkers. It's, it's now we're not necessarily, I'm not saying I'm the, I'm the smartest guy cause I am not, but I think a lot, I'm up in my head thinking constantly, you know, and I have found that that's pretty much the people, you know, that want to work with me that that's who they are. And the interesting thing is it's like when you're a person who thinks a lot, it's like, you've got like this sports car, this really powerful sports car, but no one ever taught you how to use it. And so like, depending on what situations you've had in life, you know, if you don't know how to drive the sports car, you just drive it into a pole real fast and hard. Right. And that's what it's like with the brain. When you don't understand how to run it, it's like, cause I got the same brain I had when I was 50 pounds heavier, binge drinking all the time. Right. So, so what's different? Well, it's the thoughts that my brain's churning, you see, and a big part of being able to get some control over that is the meditation and the hypnosis, self-hypnosis specific. So when I say hypnosis, I always mean self-hypnosis. Um, but, uh, those two things, because yeah, my mind was just spinning out of control constantly. I had no control over it. And that's why the eating and the drinking were the, and then watching TV, those were the main ways I had to numb that constant chatter, you know? And so the, the hypnosis and the meditation helped me to gain control over that, to quiet my mind down, to be able to interact with it and not, not always just have to run away from it. You know, so again, I think those are also powerful things to help you not only feel better, but get the results you want as well. Um, let's see, I feel like all I think about is weight. Yeah. Someone says, all I think about is weight. I, again, you know, I say that. So I want to talk about that for a second, because I think that's such a great point. I, I regularly will ask clients, you know, when I'm talking, I'm like, how often do you think you're thinking about your weight, food? related things, you know, and I've heard people say, you know, 50, 60, 70% of the time, I'm just thinking I'm obsessed with it, you know? And what I'm trying to tell you is that everything is hypnosis because you are your own best or worst hypnotist. Cause you're in your head talking to yourself all day long. You know, it's called your internal dialogue. It's your inner hypnotist. And it's giving you the weight that you live at. It's creating that for you because the way you're thinking about your weight is literally keeping you stuck at that weight. You know, you're literally trapped in this, this container of thinking, you know, and it's keeping you stuck your weight because you would think logically. Right. And I know you keep thinking about because you think you're looking for what's wrong with me. Why don't I lose weight? How come I'm not losing weight? Why am I stuck? Why can't I stick with something? You're asking questions like that because you're obsessed with trying to figure out the answer because you think it's going to lead to this cognitive breakthrough. It's going to change everything. It's not. It's not. That thinking is literally programming you to stay stuck because your subconscious mind doesn't understand negatives. I tell you not to think about a banana. What are you thinking about? A banana. Right. So when I ask, how come I can't lose weight? You're getting answers. Well, I, I can't lose weight. You know, it's like you, you keep thinking of yourself as being overweight, being out of control, not changing your eating, you know? You, and that's why the first thing I do, you can watch some of my videos on TikTok, you know? And it's like, it's, it's the first thing you're doing is imagining yourself as who you want to be waking up tomorrow and you're at your goal weight. And I'll say, well, that's not logical. I have to, I have to earn it. I have to do it first. No. Cause you need to connect to what it's going to feel like. It changes all your programming. You see? So that idea, I, I, every client I have is, is they're obsessively thinking about their weight for decades. It's not changing. It's not working. It's because you're logically going at it. You're trying to find this answer. And that's not even the problem. You know, there's no information that you need. You need, I always say like, you, you have to stop focusing on getting more information. You have to start focusing on transformation. You know, you know enough about how to lose weight. You know, now you got to start, you know, implementing it. Now I will say, you know, a lot of the tactics to lose weight, but the parts you don't know about losing weight are the mindset piece and the lifestyle piece. I, I find that missing from almost every single one of the people I ever talked to or struggle with their weight, you know? And that's what I do. That's what I teach people with. We go through eating strategies too, you know, but um, well, yeah, when you're obsessively thinking about weight and it's not changing really to me, that's evidence of how powerful of a hypnotist you are, but you have no idea how to use hypnosis. You never learned it. And so what you don't even realize you're doing is obsessively thinking about it in the way that you're thinking about it is literally keeping you stuck. You know, um, someone says, I'm always filling my moments. I have an endless to, to do, to do list. I have anxiety doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. And it's just because you're unfamiliar with it. You know, your brain craves certainty, even if it's on, you know, even if it sucks, this is the weight, this is a, a weight issue too, for you, by the way, you think you want to lose weight and you do logically, but subconsciously your subconscious mind doesn't want to change anything. It wants to do what it knows. Weird thing, right? Your, your subconscious mind doesn't, doesn't want you to lose weight, by the way for a number of reasons, but you may not like the weight, but one thing you can't disagree with is that you're familiar with it. You're familiar with being overweight. You're familiar with being struggle, struggling with the weight. You're familiar with struggling with the food, 
you know, and it's familiar. And so that makes it comfortable to a certain degree. As weird as that sounds, I promise you that, that that's one of the core things keeping you stuck, you know? So same thing with your mind. When your mind's constantly spinning, I was the same way. Like I didn't, I remember like when I started the meditation, the yoga and stuff, the reason I was drinking so much and, and eating all the time and watching TV just distracted myself constantly is I had so much pain in me for my father dying um, years ago. Uh, for what, and at that time, it had been years. And I had never dealt with any of the anger, the sadness, the depression, any of the emotions with it. And so I just ran away from them, you know, and distract myself from them. And the same thing happens for a lot of us. We have endless distractions, but we have to recognize that the distractions are not truly helping us. You know, they're just distracting us. And the problem just keeps getting worse. And so, you know, it's the ability to quiet ourselves down and take a second and be with ourselves. And it is scary at first. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people have anxiety with it. I did, you know, I didn't get very comfortable with it. But boy, once you're comfortable with it, I, I, I can't think of anything better. It's such a fundamental thing. I take it for granted now, but I do remember that feeling of, of really being scared to quiet down. You know, I used to, I'll, I'll tell, I'll share a, kind of a, I guess it's not embarrassing, I don't care, but my whole childhood, I couldn't even fall asleep at night, you know? So what I would do is I'd bang my head for like an hour, okay? Just to tire myself out so I could fall asleep. I, I mean, I was tweaked up, you know? And then I had the trauma with my dad and it's like, my, my mom was the worst enemy. My mom was my worst enemy. I was so scared to be alone with these thoughts. And so I'd distract myself from morning till I went to bed and I was exhausted and I'd just fall asleep. And I know you all know what that's like. You know, I know it's a common thing. Now it's different, you know what I mean? Now it's like, I have the ability to go inside and be present in the moment, just quiet down, be with myself, do nothing and be okay with it. I practice it every day. And I find it to be a fundamentally crucial thing to do, especially in the world we live in because the world we live in takes advantage of that. They take advantage of the fact that you have trouble just quieting down doing nothing. And so they give you more and more things to distract yourself with, you know, but it makes us more sad, upset, depressed, sicker, unhealthier, unhappier. You know, and so it's recognized. That's why I have these conversations. That's why I do these lives to to give you a different perspective, to let you know that that anxiety you feel doesn't last. If you commit to relaxation, if you commit to learning how to influence with your mind, and it doesn't have to be like, oh, okay, that's it. I'm going to do. I'm going to do an hour of meditation every day, an hour. You know, you just start small. You just start with a thirty seconds, a minute, thirty seconds. By the way, ten seconds. <laughs> I'm not even, I'm not even kidding you. They take a 10 seconds and just quieting everything down and going inside is uh, very powerful, you know? And so it, it gets you comfortable with those things. And I think getting comfortable with those things is fundamental to mastering your weight because I think that feeling of doing nothing is one of those feelings that drives your overeating. Eating is one of the best ways to avoid the, the, that anxiety of, of not wanting to be alone with ourselves, you know? So once you calm that down, it, it just, that's one of those things that makes, so I like to say to people, you in the ideal weight mastery strategy, the ultimate way to lose weight is to make the weight loss secondary. And what I mean by that is weight loss doesn't mean anything to your brain. Your brain does not, your brain and body do not want you to lose weight. You have an you have an evolved brain and body that have evolved over millions of years in a food scarce environment. This is why when you eat a cookie, your brain releases dopamine, which causes you to want to keep eating more of the cookie. And this is why when you eat a carrot, there's not much dopamine and you don't want to eat much of them. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's in built into you. You know what I mean? So the idea of losing weight in and of itself means it, your body doesn't even want to do it. You see? So you have to find other motivators that your brain actually wants to do. And so relaxing, feeling good, um, personal development, improved relationships, survival, um, more health. These things are intrinsically motivating to you. You see, so you have to make your weight loss about these things, primarily knowing that when I take care of these things, it's going to help me lose the weight. You see, because the weight loss just, it doesn't mean anything to your brain. You, you know what I mean? Like I challenge me on this. If you, if you don't believe that, I know you think you want to lose weight, but how come you haven't, you're not motivated to do it. You know, you have no brain structures in your head or in your body that wants you to lose weight. You could be obese. You could be morbidly obese on death's door. You could have a heart issue and almost dead. And there's still no party that wants you to stop eating and lose weight. <laughs> Do you know that? Because <laughs> you better, because that's why you can't get the motivation to get the results you want. So you almost, you're not tricking yourself. So you can never really trick yourself, but you're making, you're being strategic. Once you understand that there's no motivation in my brain to want to lose weight. Then you say, okay, but I want to lose weight. So how do I do it? Okay, well, you have to be strategic. You have to aim your brain at a different goal that you know that goal is also going to lead to weight loss, 
Okay. So in my mind, I, I felt relaxation, right? Getting a lot of sleep, nourishing my body, breathing, uh, you know, it'd be I mean? like all these things. And I aim at those because I know if I do those things, it's way easier for me to eat in a way where my body weight is where I want it to be. You see, but the main goal is not weight loss. I hope that makes sense. Um, is EMDR a form of hypnosis? Um, not really, not really. And I, I, you know, that stuff's fine. And, and it, it does something weird, you know, like it is cool to do it. Um, but I like, to me, hypnosis is better. Like self-hypnosis is better for two reasons. One, it's a powerful way to program your subconscious mind. And I think that's really important. When you learn self-hypnosis, you understand how suggestions work. And so then you can defend yourself from the constant barrage of suggestions you're getting. Oh, well, thanks for the rose. Um, so, so that's part of the, that's a key part of this. You know, it's like, I always say this, that, that what I, when I first started being a hypnotist, I would hypnotize people, but I very quickly kind of learned that, that whole, oh, thanks for the rose again. Um, that phrase, right. Give, give a person a fish, feed them for a day, teach a person to fish, feed them for a lifetime. Right. And I found that that was really true when it came to hypnosis. You have to learn yourself how to program your own mind for a lot of reasons. One is because you know what you want to do. You listen to yourself more than, than you'll listen to other people. And when you start to make this a process where you're aware of how you're programming yourself, you give yourself so much more ability to influence yourself in real time and overall, as opposed to what you're doing now. <laughs> because right now you're, you're logically trying to change yourself and your brain's not even set up that way. You know, so it's, it's a, it's a failure from the start, but EMDR is cool. Like, I think that's a cool thing. It's definitely cool with like traumas and stuff. It seems to be really effective, you know? So, um, how would it work with weight loss? I don't know. You know what I mean? I, I've seen it work well with traumas. Um, it, it, it's, I don't know. Is it a form of hypnosis? I'll have to think about that some more. Um, you can tr retrain your brain to look at the positive. Yeah, absolutely. You can, um, definitely. So let's see. Let me see here. I'm going to get these questions. I'm going to a grocery store today. I have no way of knowing how to shop. Oh, that's interesting. That's a true thing. You know, um, that part is true, you know, and that, that's part of, I, I blame the diets for that. You know, that they've got us so confused, you know, and so, you know, I'll make it simple for you, but you don't want to hear it. You know, the simple thing we don't want to hear. We want the, like, we want the new theory of weight loss. You know, we want that new diet theory. You know, and we don't want just the, the, the core obvious stuff, but you go to a grocery store. I have no way of knowing how to shop. Yeah. It's a learning process, by the way. You know, I always say like, you have to learn how to be a thin person and people say, no, I don't, I know what I need to do. I just need to do it. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> if you know how to do it, you would do it. You know what I mean? You don't know how to do it. You think you know how to do it. That's the biggest illusion you're living under is that you think you know how to lose weight. And you're just not doing it. <laughs> it's so crazy that it's just crazy. And, uh, that's how it is though. But yeah, so how to, how to grocery shop. Yeah. You know, there's a good chance. I mean, there's so many levels to this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like, like there are just so many levels. I could tell you what to order and buy, but that wouldn't work. You know? So again, in my program, right, we have the weight mastery blueprints. There's a mindset blueprint, lifestyle blueprint, eating blueprint. And I say blueprints that are personalized to you because you have to create a eating plan, for example. So we'll talk about the eating plan, the eating plan. You have to base around who you are. I think one of the core problems why diets don't work it's this idea that someone who you've never met and doesn't know you is going to give you a plan that's going to work for you. You're a unique person, unique genetics, unique preferences and lifestyle. You need to create your own plan. It takes a little longer, but then you got a plan custom made to you, you know? And so I would suggest this. I would start small, which no one wants to do, but that's what I would suggest. And with your grocery store trip, what's the worst thing you typically get for yourself calorie wise? Work on optimizing that. Either... Get a smaller package of it, get a healthier version of it, or don't get it, okay? And then pick something that's really healthy for you, something you think is really healthy, and get that and start eating it. <laughs> now, again, I know that you'll give you like a whole shopping list, but it's like, you just start small, right? And, and start educating yourself about what to eat. That's a, that's a real question. You know, I get that. I know a lot of people, that whole the whole like what you're going to eat thing, right, stops so many people from ever actually starting to lose weight, you know? So I get that, Um Yes, I think nonstop looking for solutions to issues and it doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's an obsession, you know, and it prevents you. It prevents you from ever really finding um, real solutions, you know, because because here's the thing, too. I'll, I'll tell you this. It's it's actually not looking for solutions. This is an important part. Is this something I always teach you? There's a solution oriented mindset, problem oriented mindset. And the person who's always thinking about their weight. It's problem oriented. Okay. Cause you're trying to diagnose why you don't lose the weight. 
which is based around the problem. Why can't I lose weight? You know, everything's revolving around that, some, some form of that. And so a solution-oriented mindset is completely different. Solution-oriented mindset becomes, how can I lose weight? And then a real solution-oriented mindset that knows what they're talking about says, how can I lose weight in an easy and natural way that's enjoyable to me, that I can maintain forever? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're not, you're not asking that question, you know? You're not thinking about that question and coming up with answers. If you did for six months, you'd end up in a completely different spot. But it's hard for your brain to be solution-oriented. You have a negativity bias. We all do. We're born with it. Cognitive biases. Write that down and look them up because it'll let you understand what you're dealing with. You have no idea what you're dealing with. You know what I mean? Like I, I hate to say this. I'm not trying to sound like a, a you know, I'm not, I'm not being condescending. But when it comes to weight loss, pretty much everyone learns about weight loss through diets. And diets are run by the food manufacturers. Weight Watchers was owned by Heinz. Jenny Craig was owned by uh, Nestle. You know, the, co the company that runs Atkins Food Products is owned by the same company that owns Annie Ann's Pretzels and Cinnabon. These, these diets that you're learning about weight loss from don't want you to lose weight. They want you to just restrict the calories for a little while because they know that, that ultimately causes you to eat more calories. All right. So your understanding of weight loss is so inadequate and limited on purpose. And you know this because they never give you the mindset piece. They're showing you what to do, but they never show you how to do it. And there's a lot of like nuts and bolts stuff to find out how to do it. But one of the key things mindset wise is that you're problem oriented and you keep thinking that by focusing on why you can't lose weight, that you're going to come up with some magical answer and it's going to change everything. And I'm trying to tell you, it's not, I promise you, because what it comes down to what your weight loss actually comes down to is you need to practice. You need to practice being thin, just like you would practice playing the piano or learning a new language or learning how to dance. Anything that you learn is a skill you would approach it and if you're gonna play the piano right is there any idea in your mind well I'm, okay i'll play the piano but if i don't know in a month i'm not playing anymore would you do that <laughs> right i'm gonna i, I really really want to learn spanish i'm 100 percent committed i want to learn spanish but i'll study it for a month and if i don't know it after a month i'm not i'm not doing it anymore screw that but that's what you do with weight loss and you don't give it a month either <laughs> you know because time compresses when you're dieting because it's an unnatural state of mind to micromanage your eating like that. So uh, a week feels like a month. You know what I mean? So there's, there's so many, th I, I mean, I couldn't, as a hypnotist, if I wanted people to be overweight and struggle with their weight, I would create a diet. I would create that whole philosophy, that whole mindset of dieting is what I would do to get people to struggle and not be able to lose weight. Then it makes me wonder, maybe there's something to that, right? Because Weight Watchers started as legit. A lady started that, and I think in New Jersey, genuinely wanted to help people. And it was mostly group based. Okay. But then the companies bought it and now they used to have their meetings and where the freezers of supermarkets so they could sell their shitty foods at the end of it. It just became a way to sell their crappy food, you know? And so, so this way of dieting is so wrong. We know this, you know, but I'm just saying it out loud so that you don't feel it's not your fault. You know what I mean? Like it's, you just fallen into it. The reason you can't lose weight is not because there's something wrong with you. It's because the strategy you're relying on sucks. It doesn't work but you don't realize there's any other strategy. And so you just keep looping through it over and over and over again. I mean, how many times have you tried Weight Watchers? How many times have you tried whatever your diet of choice is? Right? I mean, it's many, many times. You try it and it gets shorter and shorter amounts of times you can stick with it and it gets harder and harder to even start it at this point. And that's where you're at, you know? But it's not because there's something wrong with you. It's because, you know, th you're not doing a good process. My friend is suffering from overweight and kidney disease. She's only 40 years old. What is a gentle way to suggest your program to her, but not hurt her feelings? Um, yeah, easy. You can just say, you know, so anyone even watching this, if you want to go deeper into what I'm talking about here, um, I, you can go to my bio or my description. There's a link and uh, you click it, put your name and email address in, and it'll bring you to a page with a training on it. It's about a half hour. There's the three steps to master your weight. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go through a lot of things I'm talking about, but in a more, you know, systematic way here, I'm kind of bing bonging all over the place. Um, so you can just say, Hey, you know, I listen to this guy. He's got some really cool ideas that have really helped me a lot with my weight, the way I'm thinking about it. Here's a link to the, the training. If you want to watch it, you know, or send it to my TikToks. You know what I mean? Um, if it's a female, send your friend to the TikToks and let, let them watch some of those. Uh, because again, those are kind of like bite-sized pieces. But again, I mean, if you all watch my TikTok, I mean, at the very least you see it's different right? at the very least. And it's like, so it's like, maybe you agree with it. Maybe you don't, I don't know. But, but at the very least you got to admit that what I'm talking about in terms of weight loss is like different than anything you ever hear. Like, like 180 degrees different. No one's talking about like this. I mean, I'm sure there's some people are, I suppose, but no, nothing mainstream is, is coming at you with this level of depth and understanding of what's going on with your weight. Right. Because the diets are all based around the one thing. 
They, they conceptually diets. The, 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 if you want to make a diet, this is how you do it. You pick one concept, one idea, and you build it around that. And conceptually, you make it really simple because then people think, oh, I get, I could do that. And it doesn't matter how ridiculous the one thing is. It really doesn't because it's a form of hypnosis. It's, it's like magic. You get them fixating on the one thing. Just don't eat carbs. Just stop eating carbs. Well, so that's easy. That's just one thing. I could stop eating carbs. You know, you're not thinking, because again, you're in a state of hypnosis. You're not logically thinking at that point. You're very emotional. You say, oh yeah, I, I, I got to lose weight. I could, I could stop eating carbs. You know, and then you go and you start doing, you say, holy shit, carbs is everything I eat. I have to stop eating everything I eat. <laughs> what am I going to do? I'll just eat meat. Okay, cool. I'll just eat lots of protein. And then you do that for a while and the weight starts coming down. But you know, eventually it's hard because you don't get to eat anything you like. You start to feel like, uh, like someone's poured cement in your intestines and, uh, you don't feel good, you know, or maybe your body loves it. You know what I mean? And then you can just keep doing it and, and you've mastered your weight forever. Cool. You know, but for most people, you know, that's the experience. They can do it for a little while and um, then they can't do it anymore. You know, but what's the point? The point is that they just point out one thing. They take something very complex. So when I talk about weight loss, I'm talking about mindset that's broken into six pieces. I'm talking about lifestyle that's broken into eight pieces. I'm talking about your conscious subconscious mind and how to program yourself. I'm talking about eating structures. You know what I mean? That are built around you. I mean, it's, it's complex. My program is not for most people. You know what I mean? My program is not for the, the faint of heart. It's a 60 page workbook you got to go through. It's intense. You know what I mean? It's eight weeks. Every day you get you know, a hypnosis session in the morning, a five minute one. And every night you get a 10 minute one. And it's like it programs your mind. I call it like a weight loss cocoon. There's a lot of stuff. My, my course is like a college course compressed into eight weeks. It's intense because this is an intense process and the diets are always minimizing it right? They're always trying to make it seem as easy as possible. It's, it's a trick. You've got to stop people with the weight, right? Here's the main thing. People with the weight loss, it's like, they're so addicted to chasing the shortcut that they don't just put the energy into just doing it, just fixing it. You know, you're so obsessed and programmed and trained to look for the shortcut and the simple fix. And there is none, there is none, you know? And so the sooner you get over that, the better, but that's how I'd suggest it. It's just throw my TikToks or whatever, just show my YouTube channel, send them the link. Um, and just mention it, you know, and you can start it with yourself. You say, oh, you know, I, I found th this person has some pretty interesting things about weight, you know, that I'd never thought of before. It's kind of weird. He's a weird hypnotist. He got some weird stuff. He says, yeah, it's fine. Um, so does this work with goals of self-improvement, like becoming a better artist? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's everything because everything. Okay. So in my program, right. So I, I was mentioning the, the blueprint. So it all starts with a mindset blueprint and the first one's motivation, but the next one, once you get past the motivation piece and you're, you're really ready, you're, you're fired up and you're ready to do the work. The work actually starts by defining your self image, your identity, who you want to be and your identity and how you think about yourself is probably the biggest limiting factor in every area of your life. Right. So with your weight, you primarily, if you've been struggling with your weight for 20 years, you think of yourself as an overweight person. Like in so many ways, you relate in the world as an overweight person. You got your self-deprecating jokes you make. You got the ways you anticipate, you know, things you want to avoid because you're embarrassed about your weight, things you want to do. It's, it's, it's all, there's so many things in there, you see? And so the easiest, fastest way to change all of those things is to change the self-image. And you never do this with your weight, by the way. Even when you try a diet and you try and lose weight, even when you start getting some success and losing the weight, your self-image still doesn't change. You still think of yourself as an overweight person. You just think of yourself an overweight person who's fooling everyone for a little bit. And you wonder how long it's going to last until you put the weight back on, you know? And so I always start right with the self-image because that becomes the core process. Because your self-image, you never sat down and designed it. You just absorbed it from the people around you and the experiences you've had in your life. You never sat down and said, who is the best version of me in different contexts too? What's the best version of me with my health? What's the best version of me being a parent? What's the best version of me being a husband? What's the best version of me being an artist? What's the best artist I can be? Because you're used to thinking about yourself as an artist in a limited way. Because you started off not knowing much about art, and then you're probably surrounded by people that are struggling as artists. No one's supporting you really. And you absorb all this stuff and it becomes your identity. And you're fighting through it. So congratulations, but you're still limited because of the core way you think about being an artist, you see? So when you shift that self-image, that identity, now again, you have to recognize just because you shift the identity, you identify who I really want to be the best version of me, doesn't mean you just become it, but it becomes, that becomes the goal is I want to become this person. It's a way more motivating way to think about it because what most people do with weight loss is they just think externally. They say, well, I'm going to eat different. So I lose the weight. And then when I look different, I'll be a different person. Not true. 
Okay. Same thing with the artist thing. You keep trying to do stuff, but deep down, you kind of most likely are thinking about yourself in a limited way. And that's keeping you anchored and chained um, in a restricted way. It's preventing you from getting the success you, you can actually achieve. Um, someone says you can't control your environment, but you can control how you respond to it. Working on that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Jesus loved you. Nice. Thank you. Um, I like that focus on calm approach. Most of my binges are triggered from being upset. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. So again, the, the focus on the relaxation, again, it's a preventative measure that my entire program is about prevention. Again, another thing you don't hear very much of, you know, most diets are really, they're just on that surface level. So take any diet you want. I don't care what it is. Pick any diet you want, which is basically I'm saying, okay, here's the meal plan. Here's what you do. You count points. You don't eat carbs. You just eat carbs. You don't eat fat. It, it doesn't matter what the surface level of it is. They give you the plan. They say, this is what you're supposed to work out. Here's the, here's the workouts. Work out, do this three times a week, w whatever. They're telling you what to do. That is not your main problem. <laughs> the main problem is you can't get yourself to do what you already know you should do. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, like it's, it's crazy to me. You know, it doesn't matter what you know. I could give you the ultimate weight loss plan. You're not going to be able to follow it because you don't know how to change your behaviors. And you don't want to change your behaviors because you don't want to change how you feel. And you don't want to change how you feel because you don't want to change how you think. <laughs> and you don't even have any awareness of any of that process. You're, you know what I mean? Like you're trying, you're flying blind. You know, you got no sense of what you're doing. So you're just, you're literally just winging it with the diets. Think about this. I want you to reflect on this now. You're just, if you really are honest with yourself, you're just sitting here just hoping, you're wishing that somehow, some Sunday, you're just going to come motivated and you're going to start on a Monday magically and just stick to it. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's what I'm trying to say. You're in a state of hypnosis because it's not logical. It's not rational. You've been thinking that for decades at this point. I, I talk to people in their 70s, sometimes even 80s. It, it doesn't, there's no age where all of a sudden you gain this wisdom. It just changes, you know, and you're waiting for that. You're waiting for some magical thing. It's not your fault. You've been programmed and conditioned to do this through the dieting, all that. Think about it. You see millions of dieting ads. You know, none of them want you to lose weight. They want you to buy their stupid program. You know what I mean? For a little while. And it just don't work, you know? So, yeah. So when you start again, hear what I'm saying, right? Does it not make more sense? It's not about, so this person, right? So, so I like focus on the calm approach. Most of my binges are triggered from being upset. Okay. So let's take that into account. Cause that that's everyone, right? <laughs> so that person is, is the problem that they don't know what to eat is the problem that I, I'm going to send them a copy of the South beach diet. And that would have fixed the problem. Is that not everyone's problem that you know what to do, but then you get upset, tired, bored, pissed off, angry, and then you say, I don't give a shit. I'm going to eat what I want. Is that not the problem? <laughs> Is that not the problem? Right? It's a crazy to me. And so if that's the problem, why do you think there's going to be some diet coming down that's going to fix that? Like what would fix that? You know what I mean? It's not a knowledge problem. Well, it's a knowledge problem in knowing how to influence yourself, I suppose. It's not a nutritional knowledge problem. You know, I mean, I'll just take it one step further. It's like, if I gave you a book, a nutrition book with every single nutrition fact of every food on the planet in it, would that help you lose weight? Really? <laughs> it's not the problem. <laughs> so stop looking at it, but the diet's got you fixed. It got you focused on that. You know, that that's the hypnosis. You know, it's not the problem. I'm saying it. I hope you're agreeing with me at least somewhat, <laughs> right? What, what magic diet could there be? You know, what, what could it be? Do you think there's really like, like what, what could it possibly be? They focus on these macros because it never focuses on the real issue and they don't want you to eat less food. There's an obesity conspiracy going on. There's three main players. It's the food manufacturers, the diets, which are the same thing. And it's the medical establishment. They're complicit because they don't make, they don't make you aware of just what's at stake here. You know, again, I always reference back. We're like in the 1950s in terms of cigarettes. Right? Remember back in the 1950s, people didn't equate cigarettes with cancer. Right. You know that, right? The, the cigarette company sat on that, those studies, they, they hid that information for decades until it finally started coming out in the 70s and 80s. You know, now we associate cigarettes with lung cancer, but there was 80 years there where no one put those two things together. And there were studies even, but they sat on those. And so the public at large didn't associate those two things together. And so that's what we're doing now with the foods and with the weight. We are under, we're not linking together weight foods with dying and morbidity which is ill health disease, you know, but one of the main causes of why you're overweight, obviously, and um, why that's affecting your lifespan and your quality of life is your weight and what you're putting into your body all the time. But you don't think of it that way because you've been hypnotized by all these people to minimize the, the what's at stake here, you know?
But anyways, it goes deeper. Yeah. So, so being calm, you're going to recognize why do you, what sabotages you with your weight loss more than anything? What do you think it is? It's your emotions, right? You, it's not your knowledge, right? How can you on one day, how can on Monday you're focused and motivated, whatever, I'm going to eat right and you eat right. And then well, what's the difference between that and like the Wednesday where you say, oh shit, I can't do this anymore. What's the difference? It's the same knowledge, right? You knew the same thing, right? So what changed? Right? Is it not the emotions? <laughs> I think it is. So I think you have to learn how to do them. Um, you're so helpful. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. You're changing people's lives. I appreciate that too. Fiber, baby. Yeah, absolutely. Fiber, fiber. Fiber is probably the number one. I think that's the number one missing. Is it a nutrient? I don't know. There's a debate on that, however you want to call it. Um, th th some people say it's not a, it's not a nutrient because you don't, you don't absorb a lot of it, right? But um, what they're finding out now, by the way, and fiber is the number one missing ingredient, let's just say, from the standard American diet. And a lot of that is because fiber doesn't process well, all right? So they strip a lot of fiber out of the foods. Well, so they said, well, fiber doesn't matter anyway. You don't even absorb it, right? That's the kind of short-sighted, non-holistic thinking that gets us all in trouble. Is saying, no, oh, we've been eating fibers for millions of years. Fiber is one of the main things we're consuming, right? And so all of a sudden we say, ah, eh, we don't absorb it. You don't need that. I, I love science, right? But but sometimes we get so so zoomed in that we lose sight of the big picture, okay? So say, so I don't have fiber. We don't even absorb it. What's the value of it? Well, now you realize there's tons of value to it. One of the big things is, your gut bacteria, microbiome, never even talk about this. This is one of the most fascinating areas of weight loss. It is fascinating and it's fairly new. You know, microbiome, they've always known, you know, you're more, you have more cells that are non-human than human in your body, right? You're mostly these bacteria, and most of them live in your gut. And so it's like, they're what are, are digesting your food for you. And we can have different qualities of microbiome. And so if you've got a microbiome that's living off of sugar and processed foods and flour, that's a different microbiome than someone who's living off of fruits and vegetables and natural foods. And that has a huge impact. So what the fiber does is it makes you feel full, right? You have a thing called the ileal break in your intestines that makes you, it sends a signal to your body says, we're not enough, we're good. You know, a big part of that's fiber. And so if you're not eating your fiber, you'd never feel full. This endless hunger that really signifies the, the Western re, you know, experience, <laughs> always hungry, always can eat. I can eat a bunch of food. And I'm hungry right after. Yeah. Well, how much fiber are you eating? That's a big part of that, you know, because the fiber stays in your gut. It gives you the bacteria, the good bacteria, something to eat. It makes you feel more full. If there's no fiber, it's like, again, you, I always say this, right? So we're just talking, someone's just talking, um, not no one's talking about, I was talking about that, but macros, right? So we always get fixated on macros. They always point us at those. So you're going to track your fat, your carbs, um, and your proteins, right? So, uh, those categories, right? That's how they get us to think about it. But what I would suggest is a way better way to, to categorize your eating is how, what percentage of your food every day is powders? <laughs> well, what percentage of your, of your daily intake of food is actually just powders? Think about this, right? So what's a powder? Sugar and flour, are the big ones, right? And so a lot of times, you know, you can eat a bagel and it feels like you're chewing something. It feels like it's a hard, firm thing. It's powder, it's powder in a different form. When it goes in your body, it turns back into powder and powder gets absorbed real quick into your body, spikes your blood sugar. It, it's unnatural like to be processed at that level. Same thing with sugar, you know? So notice what, how much of your diet is, is powder. And if you're eating 50, 60% powder, well, no wonder you're having struggles with your weight because you're eating that powder and it's giving you very little satiety. You know, it's not filling you up. It's not making you feel full compared to eating a lot of fiber, which stays in your body, makes you feel full longer. Anyways, how much is your program? Um, my program, you can't even join it right now, okay? So it's like you can't just go and get join my program. And I do that on purpose because people with weight loss get real emotional and then to take drastic action. I don't want those people. The, my program is like, like I said, it's like a college course compressed into eight weeks. So just like college, you got to apply and enroll. You know what I mean? It's a process because you have to be committed to get through it to get the result you want. And with weight loss, people, you're just so used to not even committing. You know, I, I was saying this yesterday that it's like, you know, there's a thing called like Coursera, right? It's an online thing where you can take like college courses. Like, I don't know. I forget which colleges are on there, but it's like legit college, like Stanford. I know Stanford's got some courses on there. I don't know how many. I know like MIT, you can go through their full course curriculum, videos of the pro things and everything. Okay. So most people approach their weight loss like Coursera. And so imagine trying to get like a four-year degree doing it on your own through Coursera, 
right? You're never going to do it, right? Why? Because you're like, oh, it sounds cool. You're going to do it. And then it gets hard and you say, oh, forget this. There's no commitment, right? And so as opposed to like actually going to college, you enroll, you commit to it. It's hard. You expected that. You have support. You have a system. You get through it. That's the only way you're getting through that, right? Who's going to bring themselves through four years worth of college on their own? No one. So my program is like this. And so in order to do it, the first thing you got to do is you have to, you can go to that link that I told you about in my bio or my description, go watch that half hour training. Well, well first you got to put your name and your email address in there. And then you brought to the page with the video and then you got to push the play button. I always say this because half the people never push the play button. So you got to push the play button and then you watch a half hour training, which is going to change the way you think about weight loss anyways. Okay. And then if you can do that, if you can get through that, then I'll tell you about my program and uh, you'll find out how much it costs and, and how you can get involved with it. Um, but I don't talk about how much it is because it's, it's pointless because most people listen to this, it's not for you. And so um, you can't really understand the value of something until you understand what it is. And I'm not going to do that here. Someone says, I love your stuff. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm glad. Um, please let me know. It makes sense what you're saying. I trust what you're saying. How much is your program? Yeah, I just answered that one. Um, enjoy your content. And by the way, even if you go there, put your name and email address, watch the training. But even if you don't watch the training, um, I just, I send you stuff every day. I, I have an email I send out. Um, I used to charge for it. it. used to be a part of my program. I just give it away now. Okay. I don't, for, for those of you who don't know, um, my mission in life is to help as many people as possible live at their goal weight. And this is life or death to me. You know, my father died when he was 54 of a heart attack. So to me, weight is life and death. And I want to help you live longer and get more enjoyment out of your life. And so I realized last, last fall, I kind of reshuffled my whole business and I stepped away from private coaching. I still a little bit of it here and there, but I, I changed it more to a prog program oriented um, coaching so that um, you can get my program now for, for way less than what it costs to work with me. And I now bring you through the program. You know what I mean? So even like a few minutes, I'm about to do a call. And so every Tuesday and Thursday, we have live coaching calls, you know, to help bring you through the program. Um, but, but the, so that's one part of it. But the other part is I freed up a lot of time so that I could do these live streams so I can make videos all for free. Cause I just want to help as many people as possible live at their goal weight. And I know talking about this every day, even if you never get involved with any of my stuff, um, that's what I want to do. Okay. So even if you just go there and put your name and email address and I'll send you daily emails and I know you're going to find them valuable because every day it's just, it's a different take on all this. And you're hearing what I'm saying now. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's kind of like obvious stuff. Once you hear it, it's coming up with it and being aware of it's the hard part almost, you know? So I'll, I'll send you stuff regularly. They'll kind of, change the way you're thinking about this weight loss doesn't have to be hard you know again you're, you're you think it's hard because you think of diets and you think all or nothing and you think i just want to get fast results and the only way to get fast results is take drastic action and so like you're you're literally hypnotized that the only way you can think about weight loss is like these extreme approaches or i'm going to start tomorrow monday being perfect you know and so it's like that simultaneously makes you think of weight loss as being really hard and difficult because you only think of it as all or nothing and so, you know, I don't know, you need a much more realistic approach, you know, because again, your goal isn't losing weight. It's to live at your goal weight forever, you know, and ironically, that's an easier goal because when, the, when the goal is weight mastery forever, you don't have to take like all this drastic action just right away to lose the weight. Like that's not the main goal. It's like, how can we take long-term sustainable behaviors that are going to last? It's a completely different approach, you know, and it just makes so much sense. So yeah, you can apply. Just, just go watch it. Um, go watch that training and, and you'll see. I, I'll tell you all about all of it. Um, I'm motivated. I'm pre-diabetic and I'm ready. Believe me. Yeah, pre-diabetic. And I'll tell you something else. And I don't say this to, to bum you out, but I'm going to tell you this, people. is They did a study one time. And I forget where the study was, but it was, it was, a, it was men and it was, they had all had a heart attacks. And they tracked if they had made lifestyle changes afterwards. And it was only 20% of them changed their lifestyle. Now that made me realize that it's not motivation is not enough a lot of times because the motivation, the way most people are doing is not set up to last. That's a whole different thing. What I mean by that is that usually people base their motivation on spontaneous pain-based motivation experiences. You step on the scale, um, you see a picture of yourself, you catch your reflection. Oh my, I didn't realize I was that big. The clothes don't fit or, and, or you go to the doctors and they diagnose you with something. Okay. And now you have this pain. And from that painful place, you try and make, oh, that's it. I got to do something. And you usually choose some extreme plan. You can't maintain it. And you're like, ah, oh, shit. And so even people that have been diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease or any you know, high blood pressure, any of these things, th th that's that pain. Oh my God, I've got to do something. And you choose, you know what I mean? You get in this moment, but you don't make any real long-term commitment to it. 
you start, oh, that's it. I got to go back to Weight Watchers. You know, you do it for a week or two and then you don't do it. So again, what I have found truly, and this is what I do. I call my, my business model kind of Robin Hood model. So it's like, yeah, it's an investment to work with me for sure. Um, but I give everything else. I give everything away. So it's like, you can just watch this stuff for free forever. It'll take longer because it's just, I can only give so much out a day. Um, but what ends up happening is, is that investment financially, time-wise, energy is a key part of the process. It's really missing in your weight thing. I mean, there's very few opportunities to really invest in your weight to master it. Right. I mean, there's like, you can go away on a retreat, which never do that, please never go on a weight retreat because what to master your weight, you've got to do it in the environment you live in. Most of your eating behavior is driven by subconscious environmental cues. Okay. So the worst thing you can do is spend a bunch of money, go out to some retreat, learn how to eat healthy, feel like a million bucks, then come back to your normal environment. And it all, it disappears like that because your environmental triggers disappear like that. Okay. So please never do that. My program is an at home immersion program. And yeah, if you're pre-diabetic that you're approaching potentially the level of someone who may actually commit. You know, and that's what I'm saying. Like you need to have a different mindset. You're, you're a dabbler. You know what I mean? And it's not your fault that all the dieting has trained you and programmed you to be a dabbler and you're dabbling with your weight. You don't, you don't even really want to lose weight. You wish you'd lose weight. You wish somehow magically you just start doing the right things, but you're not really committed to it, you know? And so that commitment's really important. Oh, thanks for the roses. Thank you. Um, that commitment is an important part of the process and it's missing. It's missing for most people. We well, join the gym, you do it for a month and you'll, you'll cancel in six months. You, you'll hold on to your gym membership extra long because it feels negative to, it feels like you quit when you finally cancel it. Right. So usually let it, <laughs> people usually let their gym membership go for five or six extra months, right? Cause they just can't bring themselves to officially say I quit, but the diets, they quit because there's no official ending line either. You know, and so it's like it's basically you're just in your head and you're like, OK, I'm going to try and lose weight this week. And tomorrow's Monday. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to try and stop eating carbs tomorrow. And it's just it's so half assed. You know what I mean? That That's why you keep getting half assed results. You know, not, I'm not I hope I'm not sound like a jerk, but I just want to be honest with you. You know, that that's what I I feel like my job is here to for all you is just be completely honest, you know. And um, sometimes that may sting a little bit, but let it sting a little, you know, again, using pain is a, is a key part of the process as well. Yeah. Well, if you're serious, again, go watch that training. And even if you don't get involved in my program, it'll help you. Could you give me an example of what you eat in a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner, one day's menu? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I eat, I, I don't want to go through, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say I, I, I eat salads every day for lunch, you know, um, you can see that in my video, but, but I don't like saying what I eat because then people, I think this is a primary wrong thing, right? Because we're so conditioned to think like, oh, just tell me what you eat as if you're just going to eat that. Because I'd tell you what I ate and you would say, no, nah, I don't like that. I could never do that. And then you say, I can't lose weight. You see, that's why I always, what, one of the parts of the program is that is your eating blueprint and it's customizing. What do you want to eat, right? What works for you? You're a one of a kind person. You don't want to eat what I eat, you know? And so, yeah, there, there's some basic nutritional understandings. You know what I mean? You need to understand to get to your goal weight, but the specifics of what I eat, um, you know, they're for me. I, I've created those. They're based on what I like. And so it, it's just so easy for me to say, and you'd be like, ah, I can never do that. And then you just shut it all off. So I'm not even going to say it, but I will tell you, I eat salads every weekday lunch, um, except for Fridays, you know, Fridays, I've kind of stopped. I just kind of fast because I eat more on Friday night. So I'm very strategic. Um, but yeah, I eat salads every way. You say, Oh God, a salad every day. That's boring. Well, you know, sometimes we ought to make decisions about food that aren't based on excitement. And are based purely on how they treat our body. I call that the living vitamin strategy. You know, what do you, why do you take vitamins? They don't taste good, right? You, you take them, why? Because they're going to help your body be healthier. Well, you can elevate that process tremendously by making a food decision, you know, four times a week is my, my salads. Four times a week, you don't love it, but it's super, super nourishing and healthy for your body. Oh God, can you imagine that? Imagine making a decision based on that criteria. And I know it sounds so crazy. Who gives a shit if it's boring? Yeah, it's boring. I'd rather eat grinders and, and sandwiches and, and chips and all that, obviously, you know? But um, I also care about my health and I want to nourish it and give myself the micronutrients I need to thrive. So I don't give a shit if it's boring. You know, it's not boring to have lots of energy and live my goal weight and feel full and feel good. That's not boring, you know? So anyways... But I know what you're saying, Sherry. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not being a jerk, but um, uh, maybe I'll go into that someday more. Um, any podcast you recommend? I, you know, I, I, I honestly can't. And, and if anyone has any answer, I don't even know. You know, I have my podcast, Program Yourself, then you can go listen to that one. I don't even know. I, I'm not that, I'm, the, I'm not looking for them either, but I always ask people, tell me like who's talking about weight loss in a more holistic way, mindset based way, like I am. I never really get anyone saying it. 
You know, I like Paul McKenna as a hypnotist, but I think his approach just, it's, it's limited, you know, it's lacking. It's not enough. And so, um, I don't, I don't know anyone who talks about this level of detail. I like, um, like, uh, Susan Pierce Thompson, the bright line lady. I, I think she's so smart and I'm a big fan of the information she teaches. I, I'm not a huge fan of that approach. You know what I mean? Um, I, I got some things that it wouldn't work for me, but for her type of person, someone who's really addicted to food, it, it's probably a good approach, I suppose. Uh, but I, I think she's so smart. She talks about a lot of all the, all the de details of what's going on in your mind that influence your, your food choice. So I think that's a, a good one. Um, look her up. Um, mindset, motivation, insight, please. I know. I wish I could talk more. Like I got to get out of here. How to not get sick and die podcast. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. 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 How not to get sick and die. That's interesting. That sounds like a play. Maddie Lans Lansdowne. I'll have to check that out. Um, a great book, how not to die by Dr. Gregor. So that's who I'd suggest you listen to. Um, I don't know if he's got a podcast, but he's got like a million YouTube videos. He, to me, that guy's the Michael Jordan of nutritional research. He is, in my opinion, one of the best. And that book, how not to die was a game changer for me you know, personally. So I would definitely search him out. Dr. Gregor, um, check him out. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Maddie, Maddie Lansdowne, I'll check him out too. Have a great day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.